I have the pleasure of introducing our speaker today. My, I am uh, Luisa Franzini, and I chair the Health Services Administration Department. Uh, today, it's our turn to present the Grand Rounds. You know, Grand Rounds uh, rotates across the different departments, and so today, it's our turn. Uh, as you know, today, this year is a very special year because we are celebrating our 10th anniversary. And so as we celebrate the last 10 years, we are also planning for the next 10 years how to um, grow, how to improve the research we do, the students that we educate, uh, engagement with uh, communities and policymakers, and so on. So because it is such a special, a special year, we have chosen a very special speaker to come and present. So I'm proud to introduce Dr. Andre Ostrovsky. I hope I'm pronouncing well, his name well done. Okay. well done. Who is CEO of Concerted Care Group in Baltimore. That's um, an addiction treatment program which is focused on um, uh, providing medication-assisted treatment and mental health services to opioid users, and it's integrated with primary care and social services. Dr. Ostrowski has a very impressive career. He is a physician, a social entrepreneur, and an innovator. And I was just commenting how this is a nice se sequel to yesterday's uh, Innovation Gold Award that we had. So yesterday we saw students who are at the very beginning of their innovation career, and here we have someone who has been very successful at it. So Dr. Ostrowski completed his undergraduate and medical degree at Boston University, and then his residency at Boston Children's Hospital. He then worked as a pediatrician at uh, Children's National Medical Center here in DC and at the same time served in advisory roles for the Office of the National Coordinator for Health IT, Insight Health, the Commonwealth Fund, the National Quality Forum, and a variety of startup health tech companies. While completing his residency, he uh, also co-founded a company called Care at Hand, which uh, is a predictive analytics company focused on avoiding hospitalization. And the company was acquired by Mindula Health in 2016. And then Dr. Ostrowski accepted a great opportunity. He went to work in the government at CMS as the chief medical officer for the Center for Medicaid and CHIP Services. So while he was there, he helped them develop their opioid strategy. And uh, he worked with them in moving towards data-driven data policy making and how to learn from state and local efforts to improve health through the Medicaid uh, pilots and demonstration programs. In December, he left CMS and uh, now focused on uh, concerted, the concerted care group. So we are very honored to have him here today and uh, I look forward to his, to his talk. Please join, join me in giving a warm welcome to Dr. Andrei Rostovsky. Thank you so much, really appreciate it. Thanks everybody, uh, real honored to be here. Um, really quickly, just by raise of hands, who's a student in the room? Okay, great, this talk is for you guys. Uh, faculty, kind of for you guys too. I'm um, gonna try not to recruit all the faculty away, but if, if I do, thanks, and I'm sorry. Uh, so um, I'm gonna uh, chat about how we can eliminate disparities by investing in yourselves and in particular placing big bets on yourself, high risk, big bets on yourself. And I'll elaborate on that a little bit. Uh, disclosures, um, I invest in a handful of startups and they're all on that um, website. And I'm, as mentioned, I'm the CEO of an opioid treatment program. I am going to actively recruit you guys. So full disclosure, I'm, gonna, I'm trying to get the highest caliber of people in the country. And, um, and so I may have some bias in my presentation in that regard. Otherwise, I have no other disclosures. Um, some of the objectives. So uh, I want to talk about how, especially for the students, you can commit your career to eliminating disparities. Um, how Not just how you can, but how I think it's our obligation. I think it's your obligation. I think it's my obligation. We're going to talk about um, seeing if I can inspire you all to take risks, take bigger risks, 
we're in an academic environment, lowest risk environment humanly possible. I want to nudge you all to make yourselves uncomfortable with the level of risk that you are about to take, um, and especially as you're looking past the training part and towards getting a job. Uh, next, we'll talk about exploring the most efficient pathways to eliminating disparities. Um, there's no concrete best answer, but I'll show you a couple of tips and tricks that I think may be helpful in making sure you don't uh, lose a year or two on an experience that is maybe not the best use of your time. Um, we'll talk about spotting the beginning of the next wave, and, and I'll elaborate on what I mean by that. And I'll finish off with uh, what skills that I think you all should make sure you acquire either before you finish this program or in your immediate first job shortly thereafter. Uh, and I'll tell you why I added that this morning uh, and, and why actually that's going to be probably the biggest thrust of this talk. So um, briefly, in terms of committing your career to eliminating disparities, I'll tell you why this is why my, my entire life has been uh, committed to this goal. Uh, came over here like we were chatting in 89 from Ukraine when I was five. Uh, we came over as Jewish refugees and um, my understanding uh, was that uh, we were going on a vacation. I didn't really comprehend the fact that we were um, uh, es escaping, escaping prosecution and imminent fall, uh, fall, falling apart of the USSR. And uh, so I had a bunch of um, uh, Ukrainian sausages with me. And the reason I share this is because it, they were like stuffed into my pants. And we went through uh, Copenhagen and then to a town called Tarvayanica, which is right outside of Rome. And in Rome, uh, my uh, parents, they went and got odd jobs. And they, they told me, five-year-old, go outside and, and go sell the sausages. OK, sure, fine. Um, so I went outside, and, and I, I was selling sausages. I sold all the sausages. I was so proud. And I came home, and my parents were like, great job. You sold all the sausages. Uh, how much did you make? And I, I thought to myself, like, what, I'm not sure what that means. I hope you mean, how much did I make? It's like, yeah, well, how much, did you, how much money did you bring in? I said, I didn't. I sold all the sausages. I gave away all the sausages. And, and that was, a, 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 one, it was food that we could have eaten. Two, it was probably a week's worth of money to then buy food. And uh, so I you know, got a, a little bit of a beating there. But what I learned is that uh, the first time I learned the, the importance of sales and business development for survival. Um, and that's just one little anecdote of the journey of coming over that was uh, uh, deeply ingrained in, in, in my entire mentality of uh, coming from there to here. Um, then we came to Baltimore. So uh, we emigrated in Hayas, the, uh, basically the office of, uh, that helped resettle a bunch of Jewish refugees, uh, got us a place in, right next to Druid Hill Park. So for anyone familiar with Baltimore City on the west side of the city, and there was a lot of fireworks going on, a lot of pop, 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 pop. And I was, I was like, it was such a festive place, so much more fun than Odessa. There were no fireworks, there were gunshots. And I was like, okay, this America is pretty violent, great. So I grew up in that environment for a couple of years. And um, uh, later, in retrospect, my elementary school where I went, uh, realized that this map, a little hard to see, but basically the darker the red, um, the younger the uh, life expectancy, the more blue or light, the older light life expectancy. I'm sure this is not news to you all, but just one zip code compared to another in Baltimore City, some of the highest disparities in the country and sometimes the world. And so I was like, right, I think, I think right around there. Anyway, it was a, it was a dark red area. <laughs> And um, I bring this up because I grew up in the hood for a couple of years um, on Medicaid, thank goodness for Medicaid, uh, subsidized housing through HUD, and my family was able to kind of do the whole American dream thing and move out to the burbs, and I was able to become a doctor and, and do some of the things I'm going to tell you about. Uh, what's critical, though, is I had very dear friends who were just as smart and charismatic and had great parents, and uh, they stayed back in the hood, and then get, ended up getting incarcerated. Uh, totally could have gone to colleges, better colleges than I probably uh, got into. And in staying in touch with them, uh, they're, they're still in the game, if, if they're alive. And by game, I mean the you know, hustling and, and slinging drugs, and because uh, that's, that's how you make money in that environment. And so I've thought about it pretty extensively, and it kind of pisses me off on a daily basis that I happen to be white. <laughs> Even like people couldn't tell I had accent necessarily, but like I was a white male, and I think that's really why I got out. Um, I had friends who had families that totally were uh, creating just a supportive environment for them, but they just had 
all of these upstream health determinants stack against them, most importantly, institutional racism. So that bugs the hell out of me, and that's why I do what I do every single day. Uh, and so jumping into some of the projects that kind of take me my, my Jewish guilt and angst, um, one of the first things I ended up doing, I took a year off from medical school, went to San Francisco, worked with a mentor of mine, uh, Dr. Mitch Katz, and uh, it was the first time that I did anything truly entrepreneurial in the sense that uh, Dr. Katz said, we need a health report card. The mayor at the time, Gavin Newsom, said, hey, do a health report card. And then Dr. Katz said, right, Andre, do a health report card. And um, I was at the same time sneaking into uh, this uh, every Wednesday 4 p.m. seminar at Stanford uh, called Entrepreneurial Thought Leaders uh, Program. And it basically brought in a different CEO every week. From, mostly from the Valley, and, and I was learning customer development, I was learning human-centered design, I was learning how to start companies from these amazing entrepreneurs, and then I was doing this like health report card thing. And my takeaway there was, instead of creating a health report card, I went out and I listened to the customers, or the end users, and I helped, uh, they helped me to create what was the first uh, template or scaffold or draft of what ended up being community vital signs. And then we ended up, um, creating enough value that we had over 300 organizations want to participate. We ended up passing, um, uh, uh, passing a regulation that realigned the city health budget to the 10 issue areas that were funneling through this technology platform. And then we were able to raise capital from all the surrounding hospitals and, and that would make this sustainable. So it was the first time that I saw what uh, entrepreneurial thinking can do. And this work still continues. It's self-sustaining, and I thought to myself, I had slaved over pertussis research, HIV research. I got a paper published. I've submitted like 10 papers for publication, nine of which were denied. Like that took me four or five years, and in one year I did this. So I was like, I'm done with academia. I'm going the entrepreneurial route. Uh, I'm probably going to go back to academia eventually. There's nothing against academia. I'm just saying one year, a lot more impact than me as a researcher, and I may also may not have been the best researcher. Which is a little caveat there. Uh, then started a software company. Um, I won't get into details. Happy to answer questions at the end. But essentially, uh, took five years of failing, 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 failing. Probably the first three years, and the last two years figured out how to actually run a company. Uh, and we had, I think, some pretty meaningful impact on the aging population in home and community-based services, and in, in keeping people from bouncing back to the hospital. Uh, we ended up selling the company in May of 2016. And I'll share this just because. What motivates me every morning really is eliminating disparities and, and the guilt I feel when my friend David is still in jail and I'm out here. Having said that, money is a potent motivator, and here's why. So that's my mom, that's my stepdad, it's my wife right there, and I'm kind of creeping in the background there. So after we sold the company, we had a little bit of cash, and so uh, they never had a wedding. Right? They never had the money to have a wedding. So we threw them a little wedding party at uh, in downtown Baltimore, and surprised them, and this is my favorite part, my mom's face, <laughs> the whole, like, oh. Um, so I, I think, I don't, I, I share this because this isn't all do-gooder, like I'm gonna go save the world and Jewish guilt, like having tangible things is meaningful and it was, it was, a, it was an important motivator for me, um, but this was a means to the end of impact. Like the company that we founded and still going strong has ongoing impact. A byproduct was it temporarily created a little bit of wealth, and I happened to make my mom a little happy. So I, I, I want to make sure that um, we don't uh, look negatively upon you know, uh, consumerism, um, uh, uh, market forces, for-profit, all that stuff. It's not all about nonprofit or academia. For-profit can be a really powerful mechanism for uh, having big impact. Back to more traditional ways to have uh, impact, so advocacy. Uh, I sold my company, worked for the company that acquired us for a little bit, and then uh, I was called up to work in the federal government. I was brought there to basically help evolve the Medicaid program, the Center for Medicaid and CHIP Services, and uh, make it more of a learning organization. So introduce a lot of the principles that we applied in the software space and the startup space and apply it to the federal government space. And uh, I did that uh, before the election happened in October, November, December, January, still a little productive, February, um, legislation was starting to be put out that I wasn't happy with. Secretary Price was taking you know, private jets everywhere and misleading the public. And then I, you know, I had to kind of, I wouldn't call it whistleblowing, but you know, gent gently share some objective thoughts. And uh, so I got a little trouble for that. And um, I have to say, like, 
I would do it again and again and again. And essentially, I, like, the White House tried to fire me for speaking against Secretary Price. And, and I kept doing it and doing it. And they kept yelling at me. And um, I share this because uh, being an innovator, an entrepreneur, um, isn't always about how do you have revenue growth. Sometimes it is sacrificing what you were hired to do and eating it in the interest of the greater good. And so um, I don't know why well, Ryan is on there, which is unfortunate. But um, uh, <laughs> and the American Health Care Act was the first attempt to really gut the Medicaid program. Uh, BCRA, the next version, was the next attempt to gut the program. And um, I want to make sure that, especially for all of the, and this applies to everyone, I think if, if you, uh, you know, it's one of those, like, if you see something, say something. And I, I want to make sure that you all feel empowered, that if you ever feel like people, especially that are disadvantaged in some way, are being further taken advantage of, speak up. It's worth getting in trouble. Now, I can tell you, like, my getting in trouble here with the federal government it's like the best trouble I've ever gotten into. So moving on, um, I'll bring this uh, a little bit to a couple of academic slides. So who here is familiar with adverse childhood events? OK, great. School of Public Health. I love it. Great job. <laughs> uh, I bring up adverse childhood events because I, I mentioned the story of my friends growing up. And I was certainly exposed to a bunch of them as well. They continued to be exposed. And I, I, th I think there is a, a the cumulative effects of adverse childhood events and the, uh, the implication of social determinants of health on any one individual are so massive. And I'll get back to that when I talk about concerted care group. Um, but I, I want you to know that I, when I start companies, I literally think about this framework. I think about, has anyone heard of the bar high model? So bar high model is one of my favorite frameworks of thinking about upstream health determinants, the Bay Area Regional Health Improvement Initiative, or an equities initiative. And uh, I, I think it really nicely lays out all of the contributors in pretty great detail that are upstream of what I, as a doctor, was traditionally trained to think, which is, oh, if you give access to a medical doctor, everyone's going to be fine and good, which is clearly not the case. Um, a different way of looking at this um, work funded by Robert Johnson Foundation, which also just says, you know, it's not just about medical care. There's certainly some personal behaviors, but then there's living conditions and then economic and social opportunities. Ironically, this administ political administration is talking all about community engagement at work. It, it's all talk. It's purely they're just trying to decrease Medicaid enrollment. Um, but in theory, yes, work is a massive health determinant. And if designed appropriately, uh, it could improve health massively. Uh, the tragedy of federal and state policymaking is most policy is designed by non-designers. And we'll get to what actual design is in a little bit. And finally, again, like when I think about innovation and uh, where to invest my personal time, like I attend one night a week as a pediatrician by design for my own personal, like I feel good at the end of a shift of kind of getting a little crazy with some kids really getting sick, but then they get better. Totally self-serving for me. It is honestly a waste of it is, it is a waste of my time to go treat one patient at a time because that's only 10% of health or the cause of premature death and mortality, right? So I, um, I have a lot of physician colleagues who will chew me out and say, well, I've helped 10,000 people in my career, and that's great. There's a role for that. I think if you made it into this program, you are not a one patient at a time type of person or one client at a time type of person. And I, I, I hope to empower you or maybe to nudge you or yell at you to not spend your time doing one person at a time care. Uh, but maybe preaching to the choir, but I, if, for those of you that are thinking going into like, I'm going to go see one client at a time, you've got to do big picture impact because look at where all the other health determinants are coming from. And finally, uh, this is another pretty big influence on my investment thesis with my money and my invest investment thesis with my time, which is. Uh, the way in which we design policies, design technology, design experiences has to take into account that it's not just the, the whole equality piece. That it's not just to give everyone the same thing and like let it rip. Uh, there have to be uh, there has to be a phenomenon of walking in people's shoes, which is where human centered design is so valuable. It helps us understand this equity dynamic, uh, and this could get pol potentially political. I'm not going to get political with this. I just factually speaking, if we go with our uh, end users, whether it's our patients, our beneficiaries, whatever, uh, this is a phenomenon that that 
happens, and it, there are uh, ways to design experiences to eliminate disparities. So uh, moving on to how to inspire you guys to take risks. So quick raise of hand, who's going to be looking for a job in the next few months? Faculty, don't feel shy. No. <laughs> All right, I saw like three sheepish hands. Um, who's going to be looking for a job in the next year? A few more sheepish hands. Okay, great. Uh, so uh, maybe like a third of the room and the faculty, can, you can keep your hands down. Um, so the other thing is, and, and I don't mean to insinuate like you have to have a life partner or anything, but I'm curious, um, for the people that are going to be looking for a job in the next year or so, do you have children? Raise your hand if you have children. Okay. All right. I, okay, I get one. I point this out because uh, I have two kids. I started my company when I had zero kids, and then I had one kid, and then I had a second kid, all during residency. Software company, residency, one, two kid. The, my risk tolerance whoop, drastically decreased. So I call this out because, in, not that the expectation is you have to have kids, but uh, kids or a house or a spouse or whatever, like things that will potentially... Um, uh, spouse, I'll take away because I actually could have never started my company without my wife's money. Um, so, uh, kids, though, right? Kids, with kids, um, if you have right now the flexibility to not have other people dependent on you, exploit that. Exploit that for taking really massive bets on yourself, and and be comfortable failing because, like, so what? Like, you, you don't have two people that you have to feed. You just have to feed yourself. You could. You're smart people. You got into this program. You can figure it out. So please take those risks. And it, again, this isn't this is just me talking. So Mark Andreessen, anyone know who that is? Raise of hand. I see it, head nodding. Okay. Uh, very prominent investor, exceptionally successful entrepreneur, one of the co-founders of Andreessen Horowitz. And he said one of the most profound things that I've, I've really taken to heart. And it's about how he invests. And the way that he describes his investing is he says, um, He's much more fearful of missing out on an opportunity to catch a Facebook or an Uber or a LinkedIn, which are multi, multi, multi billion dollar companies. So, 100,000, tens of thousands times the potential return of his investment. Much more fearful of missing out, omitting, versus committing to a company and having all of his money lost. But all he's losing is just 100% of that investment. So effectively, like all he needs is to make one big home run out of 100 bets, and that one big home run will cover the losses of the 99 failures. Now translate that to your career, right? And, trans and I, we're in an academic environment, low risk environment. I want to challenge you to take this approach, especially if you don't have, like you know, kids is just one concrete example is top of mind for me. Um, if you can afford to take that kind of risk, now is the time. Take that risk, place the big bets, and place a bunch of them. And I'll, we'll talk about optionality in just a second. If you place those big bets, you just increase your likelihood of hitting a home run. By hitting a home run, I mean having massive impact. Uh, so one other kind of counterpoint to that is, yes, place the big bets. However, don't go place a massive bet and say, I'm going to commit to this for the next 60 years. Right, which is more of an academic phenomenon, right? You get a, a K award or R award, and you, you're, you're you're locked in for five, ten years, and it would be it would seem foolish to walk away from that. What I propose is take Tina Seelig's advice, uh, who actually teaches the Entrepreneurial Thought Leaders Program over at Stanford: fail fast, fail cheap, fail often. Have the big bet idea, but take a little little quick uh, bites at the apple and try to try to find a reason for that to fail. Um, maybe it's, um, you know, while you're at school, volunteer at a place that could be uh, your future work or intern there. If you have, uh, if you do, whenever you do take your job, have a side hustle. Like do consulting and l let that consulting be in a place that's really high risk, but it's okay if that messes up because you've got your primary job. I, I think the, the more optionality you give yourself and the more bets you place, it gives you a chance to go for that really massive home run um, from an impact perspective. And to illustrate this, uh, this is like very typical randomized control trial type of phenomenon, but we'll apply it to our personal development. Um, if I had gone the doctor route, I'm a doc, I'm going to commit to uh, you know, training, and for the rest of my life, I'm going to try to get to some impact. And you know, eventually, I burn out, and I end up 
uh, not being happy, and I get divorced, and I ended up end up making like a, a clinical error, and I kill someone, and bad, right? One bet, doctor, career. What if I do doctor career, I kind of start, I, you know, get the chutzpah to start a startup, and then I kind of get dissuaded, but then I'm, you know, I, I, maybe I try another one, I get dissuaded. Uh, but I only got two at bats, right? Only two attempts. Versus if you keep messing up systematically, deliberately, failing fast, failing cheap, failing often, eventually something will hit and you will have accumulated enough experiences to be an exceptional leader. So moving on to the next one, exploring the most efficient pathways to eliminating disparities. I'm going to get a little tactical here and I'm share some, some, it's not sensitive information, it's my information, so I'm happy to, to share it with you guys. Um, for the folks that are considering next steps uh, in terms of work, can someone just share, like, what would, what are you thinking of as your next job? Any ideas? I'll give you some clues. Any of these? First one, academic research. Okay, anyone else who's thinking of academic? Okay, I got a thumbs up. Anyone else thinking academic or research route, teaching? Anyone thinking of venture capital? For the two that are saying academic, have you, do you know what venture capital is? Have you explored going into venture capital? I hear one no and I hear one yes. Earlier in life? Okay, and sorry to put you on the spot, but you can say no, no thank you, move on. Um, why not venture capital now? Why research? Uh, I've worked at a startup, I really like it. <laughs> really? Okay, that's helpful. Good on you for taking that bite at the apple. That's awesome. I commend you for doing that. So I just want to point out that I think with, with the training that you guys are getting here, you could be very highly sought after talent for all of these trajectories. Now, I'm not saying one is better than the other. I think research and academia can be, feel free to take pictures. I'll send these slides around also. Um, I, I, I just, I want to, I want to share that when I started my training and I did medical route, I never got an MPH, but I, I have enough MPH, uh, MPH colleagues that uh, I think they're, um, there's a similar phenomenon. All I was taught was the virtuous route was to go to academia, ivory tower. Maybe someday you'll go from BU over across town to the Harvard program. You get your little bow tie and they underpay you and you never become full professor. Like, yeah, right? <laughs> I, this was the holy grail. And then I just got frustrated with practice and how like every time I sent a kid home who had asthma exacerbation, I gave him steroids. They came back with a cockroach in their ear and asthma exacerbation because their slumlord never cleaned out the cockroach infestation. So like, well, why am I doing this? So I, I, um, all of these are very viable routes. And if any of you have ever have questions of how do I get into those routes, I'll actually show you some companies you could go work for potentially that I've invested in or come work with me. Um, really quickly, has anyone ever created a uh, kind of a, a matrix for um, what your next career should look like? I see a yes, that's very, very advanced that you've done that. Okay, I'm gonna show you mine real quick. Because uh, when I was shown this, uh, I, find, I found it incredibly helpful. And I won't go through in greater, great detail. So I left the federal government um, in December, no plan. I had a no next step. It was like family circumstances happened. And I'll elaborate on that in a second. And um, you know, I had to deal with some personal stuff and mental health stuff. And, and of course, my wife's like, you know, you kind of have to go back to work. You know, that money you made with the company was not that much money. Like, okay, made my matrix. And uh, Google spreadsheet, right? very basic, accessible technology to everyone. Uh, my, my, litmus, my, my criteria was, is it going to have massive impact on eliminating disparities, yes or no? Two points for yes, one point for no, it should probably be a, a zero. Um, not a measurement expert. Um, salary expectations, be very candid. I had salary expectations by I, I mean my wife said, you've got to start contributing. And um, connectivity, that was an important variable that I thought I could exploit, is the networking aspect, and then can I leverage my Medicaid experience? listed a bunch of dream jobs, and I scored them, and I just went as a hit list, going one by one by one, reaching out to those folks. And some of them ended up reaching out to me, and then somewhat by dumb luck, I ended up settling where I am now, which is the most amazing fit possible. I encourage you all to be as systematic as possible about your career selection. And if you think you're convinced on academia, or you think you're convinced on policy or whatever, challenge yourself to do this, because you may find that the numbers don't add up the way you your biases are telling you that they add up. So 
Um, I'm happy to share a link to that as well, so you don't have to recreate it. Uh, so, not a particularly academic exercise, but tactically, I wish someone taught me that before I went to med school, because I don't know if I would have gone to med school. Um, being prepared is fantastic, and having like a spreadsheet is nice. It, however, it's all about luck. Every single job I've had has been a lucky break. I had, uh, my startup was started because of my drinking buddy in San Francisco. Uh, who had a like a family thing happen with his uncle? He's like, I'm starting, I'm leaving Google, I'm starting a company. I was like, sure, I could start a company. So that happened. Um, the uh, the way my company got acquired, long story, I can tell you after we had three acquisition offers. The second one got me sued by one of my investors. That was a good time, and then like we pulled it out in a month and got our company acquired, and, and that worked out fine. Coming to the federal government, like at 33, to be a chief medical officer of Medicaid, that's not supposed to happen. Um, I was grossly underqualified, but also very qualified in other regards. But I happen to have Patrick Conway as a mentor. Patrick Conway, uh, uh, who's head of CMMI now at Blue Cross Blue Shield, North Carolina, he went the same residency program as I did. I cold call, cold emailed him the first day of residency. I'm like, oh, you're a big wig. Can I get your input? And then that got me a job. Like pure luck. But I was trying to be prepared. So it, leave yourself room for luck to happen. Um, I mentioned this earlier in terms of creating optionality. Um, go for the big bets. Um, fail fast, fail cheap, fail often. I find that of my colleagues like in my cohort that are, you know, they've sold a company or a couple of companies or they're like in a very high level position in the government at an unusually young age or, you know, the, the hustlers out there, they always have a side, side gig. Uh, sometimes it's a... You know, you're a clinician, as a side hustle, and primary of a job. Or I think consulting, I, I, if anyone has a question about what, what, how do you do consulting, you guys for pharma, for managed care, for provider organizations, uh, coming out of this program, you will probably be able to consult at a 60 to $150 an hour rate. You may not need, actually have to know anything, you just have to be able to frame it the right way, but have that side hustle, get paid for learning, and that may be your big opportunity, but it de-risks your career because you may have a primary job. So we can talk about optionality in a little bit. Um, spotting the next big wave. So um, it, it, when I was creating this, uh, I, I felt a little uncomfortable putting HIV AIDS and like Amazon <laughs> iPhone on the same page, but here's where I was going with this. Each of these visuals represent, in my mind, uh, a, a phenomenon that changed the world. And so there's, Apple has changed the world and somewhat continues to change the world. The HIV epidemic fundamentally changed the world. Facebook, Amazon, um, that is a, a picture. Is anyone familiar with that? Or I don't know if you can see it. It's the uh, Learning Action Network's kind of four flavors of, or three flavors of, of alternative payment models. Anyway, it is meant to represent the move from fee-for-service to value-based payment. In my mind, that will forever change the American healthcare environment. Uh, and pay, payment environment, and then the movement from pure technology plays to services that are tech enabled, that to me is completely transformative and I think we're going to see a lot of that. So what are, why do I show you the waves? So I think uh, there has been, a, this, I don't have research to support this, I've just, I, I, I've, I've observed this. I think a lot of talent has been wasted by people going on the tail end of a wave. Or hitting the top of the wave and then sliding down the back end. I think if you're at a point in your career where you're training and you're figuring out what the next career step may be, don't squander that opportunity. Don't get on top of a wave. Don't get on the tail end of a wave. Get in front of the wave. The trick is not getting too far ahead of the wave, not getting the wave slam on you, but right, this placing the big bet. There has to be a little bit of risk to place big bets on yourself. Um, so what are the next waves? Um, these, in my mind, represent the next waves. These are companies that my wife and I have invested since January. And um, I'll share with you briefly some of the themes that I'm seeing. Um, so City Block Health, has anyone heard of City Block? Pretty new, just recently raised a uh, Series A round. City Block Health is a management, effectively a management services organization. So they take risk off of the hands of managed care organizations. 
and they do the actual care coordination and care management that managed care organizations just don't really know how to do because they're predominantly just actuarial functions. Um, and they're entirely focused on the Medicaid and duals population. It's really interesting. There's a lot of complex care involved. There's a lot of social determinants of health involved. They're just all of the early slides, the frameworks I showed you, they are translating those frameworks into improving people's lives and they are taking full financial risk for that. So if they improve people's lives, they make a ton of money. In my mind, the most beautiful thing they can imagine. So Lara Health is really interesting. Uh, they are taking existing, existing evidence-based practice like the Diabetes Prevention Program, kind of decent evidence around its efficacy, and they're helping to digitize that, and then creating a layer that allows managed care entities to take advantage of the digitized versions of these evidence-based programs. So the fact that evidence-based programming is ta being taken to scale, that to me is very interesting, as opposed to so much of software in the time I was running my software company, which is like, here's a widget, snake oil, come buy it with zero evidence behind it. So I think flipping the model of take existing evidence, digitize it, that has a lot of legs. Um, Ira is a really interesting one. This is Google Glass for people that are blind that has an audio component so that someone who was blind or is blind can now have an assistant who is sighted on the other end tell you everything around you. So the 40% of people that are blind, they can't work because they're blind, can now work because there will be someone interpreting vocally what they could be seeing. And I'm just so excited. The whole virtual um, or augmented reality piece, like there's so much rinky dinky game. Like, who I don't care. Like, yeah, you have some like teenage boy in the suburbs play another game. Like, I don't care. Ira is transforming people's lives and they're making money. So they're selling to airports, um, uh, malls, employers, getting people working and getting paid for it. And it's really exciting. Um, Nicolette is a really interesting play. It's NICU focus. I try not to focus on really medical stuff, but this one's interesting because it's basically translating evidence around empowering families with a gentle digital layer and helping to decrease length of stay. I invested there because there's a massive uh, part of Medicaid spend that is due to NICU uh, length of stay. And so I think they could fundamentally change the uh, cost curve uh, for states in the Medicaid space. Axial Healthcare is focused on uh, chronic pain and opioid use disorder, and they're basically taking data from health plans, getting it for free, crunching it with a bunch of data science muscle, and selling it back to the health plans to say, hey, health plan, here for this individual is what their care pathway should be based on all of this massive data you've provided us. Very simple, high level, but very technical from a data science perspective, and I think it's like a brilliant business model. And finally, Concerted Care Group, which I'll get to in a second. Um, so I share with you where I got to in my career until um, you know, the federal government and then did some advocacy and all that stuff. Uh, and then I learned my uncle overdosed from a combination of uh, crack cocaine and opioids. So that was awful. And uh, working for this political administration and having that stressor at the same time was, was too much. I had to, well, I couldn't stop the grieving process, but I could stop working in the Trump administration, so I left there. And um, I had worked in the opioid space about a third of my time in the federal government was creating the opioid policy, which we have yet to actually implement. Um, so I won't digress there. Uh, but I, I thought there was a massive opportunity to change the behavioral healthcare system. And I mean, there's a ton of statistics, but like for the tweeters out there, like when we had our 140 characters per tweet, it's how many people die every day? Every single day from an overdose. And it's worsening. There's like glimmers of hope in Massachusetts. Maybe it's worsening less quickly. But this problem is gonna only get worse and keep getting worse and busting high traffic drug dealers is not gonna bend the curve. Um, so there's a need, there will be a need, this is the wave. The wave is coming, and the wave has been coming since the 60s and 70s in Baltimore, and it came harder in the 90s and into Ohio and Arizona. This wave is gonna keep coming, and keep coming, and keep coming, and it will crash hard. So if you're looking for a wave to catch, and you're okay, you're a good swimmer, you're okay like not breathing a little bit, this is the wave. 
So Concerted Care Group, just briefly, this is the company I took over. Um, it was founded three years ago by a pretty inspired founder who himself had back surgery, chronic pain, uh, developed opioid use disorder, got into recovery, and he had all the financial resources in the world. He happened to also be a real estate developer for HUD housing, so he knew the patient population has housing insecurity. And he's like, how in the world can that, can my tenants deal with this chronic condition when they have housing insecurity, food insecurity, all the cards stacked against them, when he himself had all the, stack, all the cards in his favor and he barely got into recovery. So he got pissed off, started a concerted care group three years ago, and uh, I just took it over to try to scale it. And uh, we're seeing about 1,000 patients a day. We have um, our first location is on East 25th and Greenmount. Uh, I say that because we have one of, the, um, one of the highest murder rates in, in the country, and that's the part of the map with life expectancy that's like in the mid-60s. Um, we just opened another site in Brooklyn, Baltimore. So Brooklyn, Baltimore, I just learned that. South, south side of the city, which is the highest murder rate in the city. We opened that this week. Uh, we have another site in Frederick, so more of a rural-ish feel. Um, and we'll probably be opening up a total of about 10 sites, um, getting to about 10 to 15 people that will serve a day. That's the chassis. In parallel, I want to point this out, this is important, we are raising about a $50 million fund. That fund will be used to invest in technologies that we pilot within the Concerted Care Group, and that way we're able to uh, get the financial upside on technologies and innovations that we incubate and then eventually have a national footprint. Uh, so I mention all of this because we need leadership. And for those of you that are willing to be on the you know, front end of a giant wave that's about to collapse over you, but are excited by that uh, and want to meaningfully make a dent in this crisis on the front lines, uh, we should chat afterwards. Um, I'll finish off with this, so the last part of the talk. Uh, I had a, uh, a guy who's an uh, RWJ clinical scholar who was finishing up his fellowship chat with me, and a really promising guy, uh, and had all these great experiences. He's a physician, he was a practice addiction medicine, um, he's done some really cool research and outreach work and all this stuff, and I sat down, I was like, okay, cool, you know, I'm, I'm looking for talent, um, what's your experience with human-centered design? He's like, oh, my wife went to Stanford. I was like, okay, this doesn't entirely count. Um, have you uh, implemented any lean management? He's like. I went, you know, my intern year was at Atrius, and they do lean there. I was like, okay. Um, uh, have you ever done agile uh, development or ad, ha, been part of agile processes? He's like, I'm pretty flexible. And uh, that's scary because RWJ, in my mind, uh, the, the clinical scholars program creates some of the best clinician leadership in the country, period. And yet they are not trained in what I perceive as the core skill sets to make him hireable, or frankly, any of you hireable. So I want to let you know that these are my hiring criteria, uh, and there's a few others, but um, I think if you are able to take advantage of what the program here, like with Dean and Bob, have set up for you with exposure to human-centered design, if you don't take advantage of that, you are wasting your time here, in my mind. Put that bluntly. Um, Spectrum of innovation, right? We start off with imagination, so my three-year-old does really well, envisioning things that don't exist, and now like all the abstract thought that my son does, it's very interesting to watch, he's six. Now when you apply imagination to address a challenge, that's called creativity. Uh, when you apply creativity to generate actual solutions, innovation, this is where like a lot of people call themselves innovators and they stop here and they don't do anything. They don't really scale. Like, oh, this is cute, publish the paper, good for you. Entrepreneurship, that is where the rubber hits the road. That is applying innovation to bring unique ideas to scale. Scale is everything. Otherwise, you're just making yourself feel good. Um, and then improvement is like you're at scale and now you want to optimize. So what are the skill sets there? Actually, before I jump into the skill sets, I just want to point out, has anyone ever heard of the mobilizing for action for planning and partnerships? Amen. Good for you. So that was my really first exposure to process improvement. And I say that because I learned that accidentally in San Francisco. But then I was like, oh, wait, there's this like, QI thing that happens. And then I'm like, oh, wait, when we develop software, it's the product development cycle. It's all the same thing. Scientific method, but not like big shebang randomized controlled trials, small tests of change. Everything you're learning here, 
literally equips you to be a product manager at a tech startup if you wanted to, with a little bit of reframing. So it, this is not, you don't have to go like get another degree. Do not waste your time with an MBA, unless it's one of the top five programs in the country for social networking, or right, for networking. Not to disparage on the Smith School, great program, whatever. But really, you can learn much faster on the front lines and, and save your money. MPH, not the case. I support going to school for an MPH. Um, now, uh, I'll skip over this just to say, yeah, I'll just skip over. Government's slow, startups more nimble. Um, here are the hard skill sets that I implore you to obtain. Here, you have access to that, the training here. Um, it's certainly at least from a design thinking perspective, and I can give you some recommendations for um, how to pursue the other ones as well. So anyone, know, uh, anyone could share what they perceived? Well, I guess we have your answer here. Um, let me ask this question. Who feels comfortable teaching people human-centered design or design thinking? All right, two and a half. I would recommend that that number should be at least 50%. To be employable in the chain, like in, in the truly transformative spaces, to, to be a leader, I think that number has to be around 50%. So, human centered design is essentially um, a, a set of uh, uh, techniques that allow the designer to identify needs of a customer. And often, the, the real rub is when you're a good designer, it's not like the obvious needs, it's not what the customer's telling you they want, it's what they're not telling you. It's what the customer doesn't even know that they want or need, the latent need. That's what design thinking helps with. Um, this was the metaphor that I've been using in the federal government and, and, and why uh, it's so important to have human-centered design. So when we design policy in the government, a uh, beneficiary describes an experience that they want, right? A tree with three little things to sit on. There's always a contractor, booze or miter or whatever, that interprets that design as like, oh, well, this, is, this must be what they probably want. Assuming. Shouldn't assume. This is how the CMS official, when the contractor comes back, they're like, oh yeah, that makes sense. Let's put, put some sticks there and poke a hole in the middle of the tree. And then when we write the reg, which has implications of $500 billion a year of spend and people's lives, we write it with the, like, what's the point? The seat's on the floor. And what the beneficiary really wanted was just a tire swing. Human-centered design avoids this catastrophe. And that's, that's just for government. Um, this is the... Nuts and bolts, if you were ever to learn human-centered design in one slide, this is it. I'll share that slide with you guys. Um, some of the specific techniques, um, I think some of the ones that, like, Design 101 is understanding what a persona is and how to come up with a persona, which is a, kind of an average distillation of a bunch of uh, end users' experiences that, that can, um, in ideally one page, say, here is who we're designing for. If we design for them, the problem will be solved. They'll pay us money for it. Uh, I think that's a good one. These other ones are good techniques as well. Uh, design thinking and innovation, like where do they align? I think if you look at innovation, this framework is a really powerful one, which is for uh, innovation to have real impact and scale, it has to be viable, feasible, and, have, and actually be desirable. And so human-centered design gets at that uh, desirability piece. Uh, this is an example of a persona. You guys can just reference it when I share uh, the deck with you. This is an empathy map, another really good tool. I won't spend time getting into it. This is feds, career fed employees doing actual human-centered design. They thought they're initially they're like, this is a waste of time, I have things to do, and they love the arts and crafts part of it, and then they love the fact that they just spared themselves years of work designing the wrong thing. So um, I'll fast forward the journey map. Prot oh, prototyping. So um, I did this, I was on service one night, and it took me like five hours to hand draw a very bootleg version of what an app could look like for, uh, we were writing a reg for um, Medicaid quality rating systems that we were going to then tell states to create. And so I, I whipped this up, took me six hours, so like at my hourly rate, let's call it 200 an hour, um, 1,200 bucks. Okay, presented it to 300 stakeholders and users, and they tore it apart. All six prototypes. And so we did not waste, not $1,200, but the $50 million that we were going to spend to develop the policy based on these parameters. So $1,200 versus $50 million. 
Imagine what you can do with that savings. Um, agile. So the, uh, Agile is essentially uh, derived from software development and it is the, I'll just uh, show, you, show you by doing here, what Agile is not. The waterfall method of, of development, uh, of developing software. So we, uh, we, you all, taxpayers, spent $300 million developing an IT system uh, to be the Medicaid data warehouse that's, I think, took about six years to build and the data is still not out. And, and it's not really working great. Uh, it's better. It's, it's gotten much better. Um, but it, it, uh, there was some specs that started out five, six years ago by some engineers. They're like, this is the thing we're going to build you in five years. And then five years later, $300 million later, they're like, ta-da, what do you think? And it didn't work <laughs> five years later, $300 million later. Whereas Agile is, um, let's spend uh, three months with $50,000 build something and learn that it doesn't work faster, right? And so Agile is the actual processes of having, you know, weekly sprints, daily scrums, stand-ups to force that iterative um, project management. Visual example, and we'll wrap up here in a couple minutes. If we were to uh, build a car for this little smiley face or sad face person, the way we would do it using waterfall methodology is we would start with the wheel never show it to the customer yet, have two wheels, and then still not show it to the customer, then build like a car around it, and then finally build the full car, and only then, only then show it to the customer. The way to do it agile fashion is not having like a five-year process of doing this and sending, showing it to the customer, but every week you build you know, some little thing with wheels, show it to the customer, they don't like it, feedback loop. You add this little handle thingy, show it to the customer. They're less upset at you, okay? You're getting somewhere, you, you know, put some pedals on it. They're less, they're, they're like actually not, not impressed. And then you put an engine on it, they're getting kind of excited. And then what they really wanted is the convertible. And this is all happening in you know, two week sprints or one week sprints or monthly sprints, whatever, but it's not having, happening over multiple year timeframes. So that's agile. Uh, this, you guys can refer to it uh, when I send the deck around. Um, and then finally, lean. So lean management is something that um, I think I had been practicing without knowing I was practicing it. And I got some proper experience uh, with lean towards the tail end of my software company. And I, basically, most of my um, Im improvement work at the federal government was lean management. And lean management is essentially eliminating waste from processes. And it is viewed by some people as like deathly boring and not particularly creative. I think it can be very creative and it totally can embody human-centered design and agile. And it is a, an amazing way to free up time to do the stuff that we actually want to be doing, need to be doing. Uh, some of the techniques around lean, or I should say some of the wa wastes can be represented by the downtime acronym. So defects, overproduction, waiting, not utilizing talents, transportation, inventory, motion, excess processing. Um, I can give you guys more examples of that. but. Uh, if anyone's ever applied for public benefits, which we did when we first came to the States, it is, a, it is an inhumane process in many regards. Like these are people who are hungry, trying to go to their third job and have their kid with them and coming to an office and they're applying for a benefit so that they can feed their kids and the person at the office says, um, well, first you have to actually go back to this office and get this form and then it's just wasted time, wasted movement, trans Massive waste. There's so much streamlining that can happen, and lean management with the following tactics, and this is not all of them, massively eliminate that waste. So if you can get that skill set, and I, I, actually Maryland has like a lean consortium where you don't have to go get a degree, you can just uh, do some workshops around lean, you, you will be so much more employable. So human-centered design, agile, lean, and I'll finish with Lean startup methodology. So lean startup methodology and, and just general entrepreneurial principles. Um, how do I say this? Some people have it, some people don't. There is absolutely a culture and a personality trait to being an entrepreneur. Some people just are risk averse and uh, prefer not to break things. Then there are other people that, that they like breaking stuff and or they like creating stuff from scratch. And, and so that is a bit of a prerequisite to be effectively utilizing these skill sets. But even if you're not 
if you're risk averse, you can use these skill sets. Um, the most important aspect of Lean Startup is making sure that whatever it is that you're building, it is creating enough value that someone is willing to pay for it. Now they may be paying for it with their money, or in the populations that we serve, it, they don't have purchasing power sometimes, and so it's paying with their attention or paying with their time. And then all of the tactics of how do we get to that point where you've created a minimum viable product, the least amount of stuff, experience, software, whatever, that someone says, oh, that solves enough of a problem for me that I'm willing to give you attention or money. Um, I mentioned minimum viable product, build, measure, learn cycles, same thing as plan, do, study, act cycles of quality improvement. Um, fail, fee, fail fast, fail cheap, fail, fail often, we mentioned that. Um, when you, if any of you are interested in, in referencing the materials, the Lean Canvas, Lean Startup Canvas uh, is right here. Excellent tool, there's some books that elaborate how to use it and, and we can uh, get into that in the Q&A if needed. And um, let me finish with this. Uh, Maryland is pretty amazing because it, it, it gets a pretty representative sample of students here, um, as opposed to other places where you have to be like exceptionally privileged to go there. Um, but just the fact that you are given a chance to learn here is a privilege, whatever your background is. And no matter if you hustled or you, you know, you're fed on a silver spoon, um, it is your obligation to eliminate disparities in my mind to help other people to get here and then have impact, et cetera. So uh, if I can implore you to take a big bet on yourself, take some risks with your career, academia is fine, it will always be there, you can always go back to it, take the risks, go for the big home run of impact and, and know that you kind of owe it to everyone else to eliminate those disparities. Um, and uh, I thank you guys for your time. If you guys have questions, happy to field them. Or comments, yeah. Um, so really interesting stuff and things I think about almost never, so this is really interesting. Great. Uh, and so I'm just wondering, do you, do you ever worry that sort of a focus on innovation gets people to incorrectly believe that, that there's going to be like an easy solution out there at some point that avoids having the difficult discussions we have to have before, say, eliminating racism? Uh, we don't yep. have to have those discussions. There will just yep. be some sort of innovation that fixes the problem. I, I don't think that those things don't exist. It, it, those innovations don't exist. If the processes that I described here are the processes that will help to tear down institutional racism. And it could be through policy innovation. Right? It could be through different ways of creating policy. Um, it could be through different ways of creating payment mechanisms. It could be different ways of doing research. Right? Um, I, I think you make a very good, you, you allude to a point that gets me very frustrated, which is uh, a, lot of, a lot of people call themselves innovators and they're not actually they're not solving a real problem. They're talking about wearables and AI and whatever other catchword du jour, and they're not actually doing anything about it. And so with, if the upstream problems are not being addressed through these techniques, it's kind of a waste of time. So I think it's a very good question, very, very good point that uh, a, lot of my, um, a lot of my innovator colleagues are kind of missing the boat on. Any other questions, comments? Feel free to disagree with me also. I wonder if you could talk a little bit about applying agile thinking to like opioid use uh, 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 disorders mm -hmm. where the patient's initial sort of reaction might not be positive to treatment. Interesting. So I, I think I'm trying to think how agile would be used there. I think uh, the, the techniques of human-centered human -centered design would probably be more appropriate in the sense that um, having whomever is designing the, the care pathway walk in the shoes of the individual who has opioid use disorder and understand why is it that they don't like the fact that we require them to go to group counseling before we dose them with methadone, which for us we have to because that's how we're going to get paid. But the you know, we, and we may have a counselor who's like, well, they're just not compliant. They don't care about their care. They just want to. No, they actually, they have to go pick up their daughter, who they're late to pick up because they 
have to catch the bus, which is uh, like not reliable at times it comes. So like, I think the uh, techniques of human-centered design are the ones I would probably use in that scenario. I think agile, like one example of agile that is very concrete is uh, we did work for the quality payment program, like QPP.gov, uh, and the way in which we did contracting there, unlike for the Medicaid uh, IT system I described, is we created a uh, contracting vehicle that allowed uh, technology providers to bid every six months. So every six months we could fire the existing contractor and get some other guy to come in and do a better job. So everyone was accountable and, and uh, it's different from like a weekly sprint planning process and daily scrum, but it is agile in the sense that uh, we have small quick tests of change for how contracting happens. Good question. Any other questions or thoughts? Um, I'm really interested in learning more about what your the health concern care group is, mm -hmm. is operating in. Um, it sounds like you're doing some great things, but I was thinking before I wasn't sure what you were going to be speaking about today. So I me neither. <laughs> I was thinking a lot about um, you know some things I've learned recently about how different countries are dealing with uh, addiction crises, and you know learning about like what's happening in Portugal or has happened in terms of reducing opioid addiction and. Switzerland, there's all these different models. And I'm just wondering, obviously, maybe there's not a lot of reason to be optimistic about a government-led solution, but I'm just wondering, like, in terms of what you're doing, do you feel like a private company can have enough of an impact? Or, like, what, what, do you, what do you envision, I guess, in terms of what we can be doing on a wider scale to really turn things around with opioid addiction particularly? Yeah, it's a good question. I think that uh, whereas before government as a partner would be pretty critical, federal government would be a pretty critical partner, um, I think, well, the federal government is run by career staff. Right? The politicals will set an agenda and they can say no. Uh, but the day-to-day -day is run by career staff. So I think it is still completely possible to work with the federal government in a productive way on any policy. Uh, there's a, certain policies that are just going to get cut off much faster than others. Um, and so I think it's still probably worth engaging with the federal government, realizing just is that it's going to be less reward, higher risk. State governments are highly, I think, overlooked. I think state governments and local county governments are really powerful partners. Um, the challenge is scale. Like you're, you, have, you have to do a lot more reps, but that's fine. It's also opportunities to fail, 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 and get it right. Um, where I spend my time is with who controls the money. So while the federal government controls the faucet for the, the uh, major dollar flows for healthcare expenditure, Medicare, Medicaid, it is managed care entities that actually can have the control. And so working with managed care, in my mind, is where, where I am actively investing my time, but from the provider perspective. So we just closed the deal for uh, $40 million this year alone for a um, group insurance uh, for about 4 million people, where we're the exclusive provider of opioid treatment program services for them. That gives us a chance for us to show that we're doing amazing work. Here's, you know, we're not doing anything terribly innovative, we're just doing evidence-based medication-assisted treatment. That payer will be like, oh, this is worth investing in, and then in other geographies, then they start investing in it, and then boom, all of a sudden, there's actual parity. So payers are one important uh, stakeholder that have leverage and pharma. So right now, I think, in, at least in the technology space and probably in the academia space, I'd probably do it if I was leading in academia. I would say pharma has a lot of money to lose and to make. Go partner with them. Managed care has a lot of money to make. Go partner with them. And government, it's, it's probably good in parallel to do some, some work with government, but it, in this federal political administration, with the opioid space, they just do not, there's a stigma issue, there's a um, l lack of understanding issue. I mean, we have the White House doc that's going to lead the VA now. You know, like, so it's, um, yeah, uh, pharma, managed care would probably be the most efficient routes of partnership, I think. So you talked some about ACEs and clearly right now working on opioid addiction, you've also mm -hmm. that with the life expectancy differences in Baltimore neighborhoods. Did I from the I, I'm not, I'd have to check. I, maybe, yeah. Um, and you have all these threads running along. 
through CCG, how are you connecting like ACEs and early childhood experiences to treatment? Because I, I, I haven't gotten a sense of like how you're actually doing those upstream things. And on top of that, um, like, do you have folks who have addiction who are on the board? Like, I, I know you're talking about human-centered design, mm -hmm. but are those people also help, helping to drive that design process? Excellent questions. Um, so uh, what got me really excited about CCG in the first place is Noah's story and what he's done with that story, which is he is invested in housing. We lose a lot of money on the housing we provide, and it's not reimbursed. Uh, the food we provide, not reimbursed. Transportation we provide, not reimbursed. The primary care that we provide, which we need to implement lean a little better so that we mitigate waste and get it to be profitable, but we lose money on that. Um, we have uh, psychiatrists on staff that we lose a ton of money on. So uh, we have job training that we will probably make money on, but right now we're losing money on. A ton of things impacting all those upstream health determinants. And we have a, a pitiful child care room where we don't have a, a, a full-time babysitter in yet. But we will. That's how we start to influence ACEs, but I think probably the most impactful way is the mom that is doing her best dealing with this chronic condition, we get, get her meeting her goals of care, we get her back in the workforce, we empower her to get out and out and out of poverty, and then her kids get out and out of poverty, and then we start having meaningful impact. That's a generational investment. So um, it's going to take some time, uh, but ultimately it gets back to ACEs. Ultimately it gets back to upstream health determinants. And r right now, this is a phenomenon that I don't think talked about a lot. The uh, behavioral health care payment mechanisms just left block grants to go to fee for service. So SAMHSA block grants, now Medicaid fee for service is the predominant payer for this population. And whereas Medicare is like almost reaching its goals around uh, value-based payment and hitting at least 50, 50 cents of every dollar in value-based payment. We're a decade behind where Medicare is. So until we get to category three, four alternative payment models, we're just going to get more and more into the fee-for-service problems. Uh, but we're, I mean, we're grateful to even get fee-for-service at this point. Um, once we get to risk-bearing, then the whole space will change, but that requires competence amongst providers, which is why I went for a for-profit, not a non-profit. Because that's scale, it's capital I can raise, even though it's hard to raise the capital. Um, so yeah, this is like a minimum decade-long investment to really bend the, the curve on ACEs. But it's doable. Oh yeah, the board. Um, we, never had a, uh, we never had a consumer on our board. Um, we don't have them on our board yet, that will change. But we have implemented a monthly uh, consumer advisory board, which is fine. But you know, it's it's good. They have like a really important say. What is probably most important is I have taught my senior management at least the foundation of human centered design, and now they are imposing upon all of the frontline staff to walk in the shoes of our of our consumers, including um, for our senior management. We will be going to sleep in our housing, which, I mean, we provide it's better than under a bridge, but it's still in northeast Baltimore with gunshots outside housing. Um, so uh, that is a really quick way to develop empathy, which I think is better than having a consumer on the board, because we're literally, literally living with the consumers. I think that's how we'll probably uh, improve our processes. Great questions. Yes, please. I'm, I really enjoyed your presentation. Thanks. Thank you so much. And I want to get back to the um, opportunity to maintain a risk-oriented mm -hmm. uh, pathway for everyone, but the reality is some of our folks are going to end up within the government, whether mm -hmm. it's local, state, or federal government. In order to reach the utopia of a public-private partnership, yeah. what kind of entities do the governmental agencies have to have in order to partner with someone like you effectively. In order to address the, the issues you're addressing right now. I, I don't know if it's a matter of entities. I think that the way to have effective public-private partnerships is having people 
who have spent time in both places straddle both places. And I've had criticism from my colleagues who say, well, you just left Medicaid and you're going to make all this money in the private sector exploiting your expertise. Like, yeah, I hope so. But I, there's no way that I would be able to navigate what I navigate now without that experience. There's no way that I would have been able to create the value until I spoke up in the government had I not done the running a company thing. Um, I think if the trainees that are do, uh, not doomed, destined for government, or you slip, destined for government. <laughs> no, no, I, I think it can be very virtuous career pathway. I think if if that if they've declared if they've self-identified early, they're going the government route, forcing them or empowering them, whatever, to have that experience in the to, to gain those other skill sets and see what it is like to uh, work on the vendor side of things or the entrepreneur side of things, so that when they are in government, they walked in the shoes of a little bit and they can be more effective change agents and facilitators from within. Um, I don't think we have to have, I, I fully support CMMI, so grateful it exists. The real change that happens is not from CMMI. Like we've only, we have, haven't really scaled any models. What does scale is when we have receptive ears inside the federal government, the people that write the regs or control state plan amendments, 1915 waivers, or 1115 demonstrations that understand that, okay, you know, managed care has these constraints and they're not just trying to get more money, they actually want to increase access to care, but they have to under, understand that. And if everyone is speaking the language of human-centered design and we're all talking around a persona, and if we're all iteratively giving each other feedback and small tests of change and not just like throwing over the wall, here's the 1115 demonstration, application, go figure it out, but rather we do like a one pager, like, what do you think, that can make a world of difference. It's the, if, you're, if your trainees coming out of here are prepared with that, they, they'll very quickly rise to the top. I mean, not in this administration, but like in normal administrations, they'll very quickly rise to the top. Um, outside for a reception afterward, and let's thank Dr. Thank you very much. Thanks.